Well, good morning. Another day in Canary and Paradise. just starting to rise day one of exploring and I've got a real treat for you today I've got lots of great things to see some haunted houses and hotels as usual and an interesting aircraft for all you aviation enthusiasts so stay tuned for day one in the Fiat 500 electric as we explore Grand Canaria so I think most people have heard of the Fiat 500 so to buy one of these cars is now more than 30,000 pounds in the UK and we'll talk a bit more about the car as we go and we'll see how it performs so as I'm looking this morning, I can see that we've got 81% left battery, which has given me an approximate range of about 200 kilometers. So that's fine for what we need this morning. So one of the first things I wanted to show you today on day one of the tour of Gran Canaria with the Fiat 500 electric, as we tour around and see some of those great sights, is this EC BBT, an old DC7, and it has massive historical significance for the whole of Gran Canaria and I'll tell you why as we have a look around. And so what you're looking at here basking in the morning Canarian sunlight here in Gran Canaria is a DC-7 that was built in 1958 and originally went to Swiss Air and they wanted to fly it on non-stop flights to the US and realizing that financially that was suicidal. What then happened is to cut a long story short is that it was sold to some of you may remember a Spanish charter airline many years ago, very big in the 80s, 70s and 80s, a company called Spantax. And they were a long since forgotten airline, really. There's very few people still remember them. But in essence, to cut a long story short, Spantax operated this aircraft and pioneered the first ever tourists to the island of Gran Canaria from mainland Spain with this actual aircraft. And as always, I just want to say a huge thanks to my really great Patreon supporters. It's people like James, Joe, Kieran and Joshua who help me to bring these videos to you every month. Anyway, as you can probably see over my shoulder, the sun's starting to rise now. It's nine o'clock in the morning or thereabouts. And I've got two things I can now do. I'm either wondering if I go and pop some more power into the Fiat 500 electric or whether I go on to the next part of today's tour. You know how I said I'd never seen torrential rain in the Canary Islands? Well, take it all back. This was not forecast today. This may change my plans because three of the sites that I wanted to show you today are all outdoors, unfortunately. However, however, let's not let that ruin our day. Every problem is an opportunity, as my old boss used to say. It wasn't, it was just all one big lie. But nevertheless, I get the point. We will adapt, we will adapt, and we'll find some new places to see. So there we go, what did I tell you? The sun's now out, five minutes since that rainstorm. And as you can see already, the roads are starting to dry, the temperature's starting to lift. Okay, so, uh, quick update on the charging situation. The sun's really come out now. A bit weird, to be honest. The first couple of charges I tried were broken, and we were down to just 20% power. Uh, so I found a petrol station, a diesel petrol station which doesn't take the card so I'll just have to pay for it but the problem is I was down to 20% I'm gonna to have to pay anyway uh, so we'll see how much it is the problem is that this is a slow charger so it's saying that to top it up to 100% is gonna take three hours and 20 minutes which you know in practice that's just unrealistic isn't it I don't really have the time or the inclination to sit here for three and a half hours well, it's charged up to 100%, so I'm going to get enough power to get us to one of these uh, charging stations that takes the card. And then we'll see where we go from here. But this is the problem is, as I suspected, uh, I took a drive up around the mountains, and you'll see that in the video. That's where it really zapped the power, so we really went from sort of 65 70% of available battery power down to about 20% in a matter of about 10 miles because it was climbing to the top of a hill. Now, 
don't get me wrong, I got some power back with the regenerative braking as I was coming down off the mountain, but nowhere near what it had used to climb. If you stop at the DISA stations, the D-I-S-A, it's a Spanish petrol chain, you can't use payment cards at all. You have to go and see the attendant in the office who opens up the power port, switches it on, you plug it in, and then when you're finished, you go and pay it in the kiosk, and then you take the plug out, job done. So now that I know that, that's a lot simpler. So that was quite good. Also, the fuel rate. So I've driven about 60 kilometers this morning, and I went to pay for the electricity I've just put into the car, and he charged me for 60 kilometers, just four euro. That seems pretty good in the UK. Maybe energy costs down here are just so much cheaper, I don't know. But certainly I thought that was very reasonable, very reasonable. But the problem, as I said, is the charge rate was very low. It was going to take about three and a half hours to get it fully charged, which I don't really want to do. I don't want to sit at a petrol station when I'm on holiday, uh, you know, waiting for it to charge for three and a half hours. So I'm going to head back to my resort, Mas Palomas now, where there is one of these. The chap was very helpful, actually. He didn't need to tell me this, but he said, if with this card, and he gave me a map and drew all where the, the, these machines are. So I'm going to go and try one of those now. A, they're a bit faster. B, it costs me nothing. And C, well, hopefully there's a C. Okay, so quick update on the electric car. Uh, we've run into a major problem here, folks. I don't mind saying I may have to throw the sound in on this one and go and get a standard petrol or diesel from the hair car company. So since we left the petrol station, where I did get some charge, but it wasn't very fast. It was showing about three and a half hours to recharge, but I needed some energy because I was down to 25%. And I'm not sure what 25% means in this car. So I found the official charger that takes this card, which is in a hotel in Mas Palomas, which has highlighted two problems. The first problem is because I'm not staying at the hotel and because the charger's in the car park, the hotel charged me five euro to come in and use the charger which ordinarily you'd think, well, that's fine. You can kind of live with that. The other problem is that whilst this is a seven and a half kilowatt charger, so not the fastest by any means, but still not the slowest, it's showing now it's going to take five and a half hours to recharge, which is basically my entire afternoon, um, which is really frustrating. It's really, really frustrating. There are some 30 kilowatt chargers in the area. The problem is that I'm now down to 15% power. So if I start driving around trying to find those, which I probably will, the problem is if they're broken, and I've already found two broken ones here this morning. So it might just be a beach day today, I think, whilst I recharge the car. The other problem is that to see all the places that I want to see on the island, I just haven't got enough battery power, and you can't rely on the chargers. But it's an experiment, and experiments can only go one of two ways. They can either work or they can't. At the moment, it's the latter. This really isn't looking good. Oh, that's frustrating. That is really frustrating because it's sunny as well. And I wanted to see a few of the sites and show you some of the places. Let me go and have some lunch. Let me see if I can find these other 30 kilowatt chargers. Let's see where we go from there. So, quick status update for you on the electric car on day one. As you can see, I'm now on foot walking back to my hotel. So, um, yeah, it has not been a good start, I have to say. Uh, we saw the DC7 this morning. All was fine. It killed the battery going up the mountains, as I suspected it would, and as I was told it probably would. That said, I thought, well, I'll just find some chargers. There's plenty of them around. And that's where it all started to go very, very, very wrong. It's two o'clock in the afternoon now. I've been on, probably on the road for now, six hours, and seen the sum total of one attraction, the DC-7. And that's it, because I've spent the last six hours driving around stopping to pick up charge where I could, but then finding broken chargers, starting to drive on, but because my battery level was low, I had to stop and pick up small amounts of charge at a time. But because those chargers that were working were so slow, I didn't want to sit for three and a half hours at the roadside. Now, I don't have much experience with electric cars in the UK, but here, there are a lot of broken chargers. The speed of the chargers that do work is very, very slow. So where I am now is that I've found a charger at somewhere called Holiday World in Mas Palomas, which can do up to 30 kilowatt charging, which is about the maximum I've found here on the island. And it's working. And there were a bank of 10 of them, not one of them being used. 
the car park gives you four hours free parking uh, although I've had to pay 10 euros to use the charger because it's not included in the card plan so it says it's going to take about three and a half hours to do a full charge so I'm just going to leave it in the car park at Holiday World charging up because I want it full there's no point I'm just sick and tired of stopping today and just picking up charge as and when I can and I've not had any lunch yet so let's leave it charging let's get it to 100% that'll take till about five o'clock it said so where did the idea come from to make a video about driving an electric car in the Canary Islands well over Christmas, a friend and I were watching a well-known YouTuber who, about a year and a half ago, inherited a huge sum of money when his dear old mother died. And he didn't know what to do with this money. He had loads of money, he didn't know how to spend it. He'd already got a house and properties in England and, and down here in the Canary Islands, in fact. So he bought himself a Porsche, the electric Porsche, the Porsche Taycan. And about a year later now, he makes videos constantly, constantly hating on the Taycan. He absolutely hates this Porsche for all of the reasons that you probably imagine I'm going to tell you right now. So he doesn't like the infrastructure, he sends the chargers if they're working too busy, they don't charge fast enough, the range on his Porsche isn't enough, he gets range anxiety. Now, oddly enough, when my friend and I were talking about this, and we were sort of just watching the video and just chewing the fat about this person, I'm not going to mention who he is, you probably know who he is. And we were talking about it, and my friend said, do you know what, I bet electric cars in the Canary Islands are rubbish. And that got me thinking. And so I said, you can hire those in the Canary Islands, Sea car do them. So my friend said, well, why don't you do it? You're going down to Grand Canaria in January. Why don't you hire one, see what you think? So I thought, yeah, why not? Sure, let's do that. So that's where the story came from. That's, it wasn't a random thing. There aren't many videos about people trying out electric cars on the islands down here in the Canaries, and that's probably because they're just not that good. Update for you then, some good news at <laughs> long last. So this is still day one. I'm just trying to go and find somewhere to get a big glass of whiskey. <laughs> so yeah, this has been tough today, guys. I'm not gonna kid you. This has been a difficult day with the electric fear. It's not worked out very well, and I've lost a day of the making videos, basically. I haven't been able to go to show you any of the places I wanted to today. But there is an upside to this, and that's because if you're in Mass Palomas and struggling to find somewhere to charge, then come to the lower level car park of Holiday World, of all the places, and it was the hotel where I'm staying said, try the Holiday World. They've got a bank of 10 chargers, and sure enough, in two and a half hours, so I left the car and just went back to the hotel, did a few things. So in two and a half hours, the charge level's gone from 9% up to 84%, and that's only because it hit the cash limit, so it cost, a 10, cost 10 euro to do that. Um, and that's gonna get me about another 80 kilometers, so it's not great. But that's the point, it's the Canary Islands, it's mountainous, and electric cars, that's, this is where they really struggle. You know, where I live in Northern England, I'm never gonna face struggles like that. It proved the point. Anyway, let me give you a reference point on the video here. This is what you're looking for. And as you can see, I think this is the only car that's probably been here all afternoon. And there it is, my goodness. It's a nice car to drive. Uh, I'm not gonna judge it just yet because it's still day one. I've got it for a few more days. I am going to tomorrow take you and show you all of the places that I wanted to show you today. And I've done a bit of research. I think the chargers up north are still gonna be that sort of seven, eight kilowatt an hour. These ones here are up to 30, so I'm much improved. Um, but again, you know, Every 80 kilometers, you're gonna to have to allow, even on the fast chargers, a good two to three hours to charge it up. That said, it's all part of the experiment and it's all part of the fun. Sun is still shining, it's 23 degrees outside. So yeah, I'm gonna go and find a shop, get that bottle of whiskey and watch this evening's Apprentice. I'll see you tomorrow. So, attraction two, we've finally made it. So yesterday we saw the DC7, as I said. <clears throat> it's taken a little while to get here, but we are at the Brank. We are at the Barranco de Azuaje. Azuaje. I think I pronounced that right. Apologies to any Spanish people. I do try. But basically, this is a hotel abandoned around the time of the Spanish Civil War. And like so many buildings in the Canary Islands, it's just been left intact. The land, as I understand it, has reclaimed some of the hotel. I guess we'll see it when we get down there. If you're going to come and see this attraction, 
there's very limited parking, although there is some roadside parking, which I've found. And then you just have to walk the last half mile or so. And it's a fairly steep drop as well. Uh, but we'll see how we go. And I'm going to find the hotel using my Apple Watch. So I've just punched the coordinates in to my Apple Watch and it's going to take me the last few feet to make sure I can find it. But I think I understand it's not that difficult to find anyway. So yeah, let's see how we do. And we're definitely heading in the right direction because the Apple Watch is telling me that the hotel is now 900 feet ahead of me. So that's a good sign, I think. And so here it is. Finally found it, a little bit breathless. What a bit of a hike. And I'll just have to cross this stream here to get to have a look around. There's a notice board up here, let's just see if that says anything. So the kind folks at the tourist board of Spain have given us some information here. Unfortunately, I'll have to stand, I'll try and get what I can on camera, but underfoot there's quite a lot of water just flowing and um, whilst I have got my walking boots on, standing in puddles is not advised. So this is what you can see from the outside. And as I said, classic Canarian building that's just been abandoned. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but you've got some of the plaster on the ceiling just falling down. But uh, proving a bit difficult to get into, but still a great building to have found. So, quick update for you on the whole charging situation. I found these public chargers, which are located in the towns and cities around the island. So I'm in a place called Moya, up in the mountains, about 1500 feet above sea level. And I think these are just put here by the Canarian government. And you just plug it in, as you can see, our car is plugged in. And again, you have to register with the app, input your credit card details. The difference between the public ones and the private ones, as I'm now seeing, it's the BP one we saw earlier. Uh, you just put your card details in and then it bills you afterwards. With the government ones, you have to register your account, register your card, and then preload your account. So I've put 20 euro on the card, and it's and I chose to have only 15 minutes of charge just to see how much power it gives us, how many additional miles and percentage it gives us. But that cost me 12 euro, so that's really expensive. 25 euro, 25 cents per kilowatt hour, which surprisingly compared to the private ones of the BP garage, this is really expensive. Which is surprising because I would have thought if it's government backed it would be to try and incentivize people to get into electric cars and it's kind of doing anything but. Anyway, we'll see how we do. And one of the things that I do like about all of these systems is that it tells you the actual recharge rate. This one is a 10.31 kilowatt hour charge. So I can tell you that that's not brilliant. It's not, not anywhere near as good as the BP one that we found earlier. And it's only marginally better than some of the ones that we found yesterday. But that said, it's working. It's working. And believe me when I say that is a victory in itself, which shouldn't be the case, of course, but that's what we're finding here in Gran Canaria. Okay, so this is the House of Fear, which we found. It's all padlocked off, unfortunately, which is rather frustrating. But I'm going to try and find a way in. It has drawn a lot of interest, and it's actually been the subject of a quite an in-depth documentary as well, actually. Nobody knows exactly what happened here. Everything rumoured from a guy butchered his family to death to simply the owner died and it was left in a derelict state and the, the state of the Canarians doesn't know next of kin to hand it on to. As we say in Britain, he died intestate, as in the guy didn't have a will, nobody knows who to leave it to. And in typical Canarian fashion, it's just been left and locked up, <clears throat> which is a real shame because I did want to show you around. That's, uh, that's very frustrating. And just down here is Balneario Los Berizales. I think I've pronounced that correctly. 
at its height in the 30s, this was a bottling plant for the natural springs, the water that came off the mountains, which you can see, or which I'll show you in a moment. I couldn't find when this place actually closed and it's all sealed off and we'll take a walk around in a moment. So I can't sort of take you on a guided tour of the place. Unfortunately, the third attraction that we've found today in Gran Canaria, which I couldn't access. And of course, if there's an open way in, I'll always show you that. But clearly if it's padlocked, there's a reason it's padlocked and they would regard it as breaking and entering if I was to do that. The two facts that I've been able to establish are one, that in 1912, there was an almighty great landslide from the mountains that sit uh, right behind the bottling factory here that wiped the place out. Huge damage, it took years to repair. But the water was extremely popular in the 1930s with the locals, and they couldn't get enough of it, of course, it was free flowing. They didn't need to worry about that, but the locals loved the spring water off the mountains here. and. The family that eventually owned it, the Armas family, of course, of shipping origin here in the Canary Islands, well, across Spain, in fact, bought the place in the 30s. It was in its heyday. And the one fact I haven't been able to establish, unfortunately, and I'll, I'll try and establish this when I get back home, of course, is when it actually closed, because as you can see, it's fallen into disrepair. As have so many buildings in the Canary Islands, and just like every other building we ever see here, whilst doing urbexing in the Canaries, the authorities have just left it, as they do. So some interesting facts for you there. I'm not sure if you can see my Apple Watch. We're about 1144 feet above sea level. And so what I'm going to try and find next, although I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it, is the Hotel Princesa Guayamina, which is, was built around this area and again sold itself on the local mineral water, the qualities of mineral water. I'm actually 85 years old. I just drank Agatha water. <laughs> Joking. So... I'm going to try and find that hotel, which was actually operational until very recently, although it's rapidly fallen into disrepair according to the pictures that I've seen. So I'm going to try and find that because that would be even more interesting. Let's go. And so as luck would have it, just further up the mountain road from the spa, I've found what remains of the Guayamina Princesa Hotel and the crane that we saw actually earlier, thinking it was something to do with the spa the water bottling plant it wasn't it's actually here because the hotel is to quote from a website undergoing renovations which to me well looking at it i don't think this hotel is going to open again in a hurry but the more startling fact which definitely underlines my view on the spa when it closed the water bottling spa this hotel didn't close until 2006 and it was purely down to a lack of tourism and as the similar to Tenerife as the hotel started to grow and modernise in the south of the island. Tourism up here just really dropped off and unfortunately, like I say, it closed in 2006 but, but to look at it you wouldn't think this hotel was still operational just 20 years ago. Well, less, less than 20 years ago in fact. I think just sort of less than two decades ago you could have come here and checked into this hotel. And it was listed with all of the main tour operators. That's something that I was able to ascertain. And again, you can't access this site. I would give it a go, but there are workmen around. You know, it really does blow my mind when I look at hotels like the Guayamina Princess, not to be confused with Guayamina Princess 2 in the south of the island. Because as I said, you know, sort of 70s, 80s, most of the 80s when I was growing up, we would have stayed in hotels like this and we'd have loved it. We'd have loved the two weeks in the sun every year. And what strikes me about hotels like this is that it's, A, it's sad to see them go and fall into disrepair that this clearly has. There's no way this hotel is ever going to reopen again. But you can't help but feel a certain amount of nostalgia when you look at these hotels, because if you cast your mind back to what you were doing in 2002, 2004, it probably doesn't seem that long ago to you. And yet, 
it's a world of difference to the people who used to holiday here. Because back in 02, 2003, 2004, when this hotel was still operational, people had been swimming, people had been having a good old time drinking in the bar, watching the TV, watching Sky TV perhaps. Because all of those things were here when this hotel closed. I know that things change. I recognise that modernisation happens. But surrounded by this glorious mountainside and these stunning views, you kind of think, where did it go wrong for this hotel? But there we go. But there we go, without getting too sentimental about things. So, what's up next? Well, and I'm going to head back to the hotel now because the Fiat 500 electric is down to about 50% power. We've done a whole lot better today on power, I must admit. I've been a lot more confident with the car. I've been able to drive a bit further, not have that range anxiety that I had yesterday, primarily because I found some new chargers that actually work. And so I'm going to drop the car back to Holiday World in Maspalomas, leave her on charge overnight so she's at 100% tomorrow. So if you're enjoying the video so far and I've sparked a bit of an interest in urban exploration and urbexing, as it's called. If you want some more details, head over to my website, momentsinthesky.com forward slash blogs, because there I go into a lot more detail about these buildings. We've got photographs, we've got a lot more history. And I also tell you about some of the things you can do if you want to get into urbexing, certain details around the laws around urbexing, because it's not straightforward and how to do it safely, of course, which I always do. Mostly, I have had things fall on me before. And if you want to know any more about Grand Canaria, or indeed the Canary Islands, it's all there on my website. And the final thing I just want to say on the website is that it's not just about urbexing. Obviously, I love Grand Canaria, I love the whole of the Canary Islands, I love seeing different places. So on the website, there's also some useful information about flights, about hotels, places to stay, places where I've been. So if urbexing's your thing, if the Canary Islands are your thing, and hopefully they are, hopefully I've convinced you now, it's a holiday down here in the Canary Islands because they do need the money at the moment. It's all on the website. And of course, if you want any more information on the Canary Islands, just don't hesitate to drop me a note. All the contact details are on the website. So for now, I'm going to drop the old Fiat 500 electric back to Holiday World, which is a known good charger, 10 of them in fact. Let's get her all charged up, ready for tomorrow's adventures to the peak of Gran Canaria, and I can't wait. We're looking forward to it. Bye for now. Well, good morning. Day three here on the fabulous island of Gran Canaria. The car had a really good charge last night. It was for the first time, in fact, since I picked it up from the hire car company. The battery life is at 100%, or it was when I picked it up. So really good charge and prepared for the day ahead where we've got lots of good things to see. The first thing I wanna show you is the infamous sand dunes of Mas Palomas, Dunas de Mas Palomas. And I'll give you some facts about the dunes because it's not simply sand. You might think, oh, why is he showing us sand? It's much, much more than that, ladies and gentlemen. So I said I'd tell you a bit about the sand dunes of Mas Palomas, Dunas de Mas Palomas. So the sand, which we're about to see, was washed up from the bottom of the ocean during the last ice age when the water retreated and the sand was left exposed. And over a long period of time, the wind blowing has carried the golden sand towards the shore. And this is how the dunes were born. Even today, and this is the most interesting fact, is the dunes are moving constantly from east to west with the winds at a rate of about two to five metres a year. And there you have the dunes of Maspalomas on this rather windy day. And you can see that wind blowing the sand east to west, which happens all year round. Let's take a further walk down here. Now, the other thing I need to warn you about, ladies and gents, is that Mas Palomas is, of course, one of the biggest naturist zones on the island. So you will see naked people, I guess, if you stare hard enough. The sand dunes actually appear to just go on and on forever, but they don't. They only occupy about a thousand hectares of land. It just looks because they're just hill after hill after hill of dunes. It just looks like they go on forever. So 
so now we've seen the sand dunes of Mas Palomas. We're going to head west and head inland a little bit to Mirador del Balcon, which is a superb viewing platform over the south of the island, over the sea. <laughs> and the dog's very interested in me. <laughs> All there, Shih Tzu. And uh, from here, we're going to go see Mirador del Balcon. Uh, it's a little bit west, not too much of a drive. And then we're going to stop for lunch at a really nice little fishing port town called Porto de Magan, which is a fabulous place to stay. I was going to stay there on this trip, but the cheapest hotel I could find was 200 quid a night. And you'll see why, you'll see why. You might think that's expensive, and it is. But you'll understand why when we get there. It is probably, well I think, the best place to stop for lunch on the whole island. So let's go. So welcome to Torito. I don't know what the Spanish translation is for that word, but basically what they should call this town is hotels, because that's what it is. It's a bay resort, which is just all about hotels. That's literally all there is here. And it's been built entirely for tourism. And I don't blame them because it's a nice area. But as you can see, I'll just show you around. There are literally wall to wall or mountain to mountain hotels. I don't want to go too far because I'll give away the game here. But I haven't brought you here to talk about the hotels in the town of Torito. We do enough of that on this channel, right? There is one particular hotel I want to show you, which came up on the radar when I was researching this trip. Now, back in 2017, I think, there was a massive landslide which closed the main GC500 road up to the town of Mogan. And essentially, nothing has been done to reopen this road. You're starting to see the pattern here, aren't you? <laughs> Things that go bump in the night in Spain, particularly in the Canaries, just stay bumped. Nothing ever changes. When it breaks, it just gets left broken. So I think while I'm here, we should have a look around. Clearly other Urbexes have been here and what's the worst that can happen? They can only tell me to do one, don't they? It's all very strange. It's very, just so typically eerie. I mean, <laughs> as somebody who's into the Urbex scene, the, the Spaniards and the, the Canarians really do make my life very easy <laughs> with these things. I'm just gonna walk up these stairs. And again, I'll sound the danger note here because I'm from Britain and I've been brought up with health and safety. <laughs> These buildings are extremely dangerous. As you can see there, just nails hanging out and there's no guardrails or anything like that. So whilst I would endorse anybody and encourage anybody to get into urbexing as I have, and I've really only been interested into it sort of the last year or so, do exercise extreme caution folks, because if like me, you've been brought up, wrapped up in cotton wool, Health and Safety Britain and all that. Well, it's right across Europe, isn't it? Where people really aren't encouraged to take risks these days. And people don't really understand the fun of taking risks. You've got to be so careful with these places because you're just not used to it. There is nobody to hold your hand here. There is nobody to save you if something goes wrong. So welcome to Puerto de Magan. Fabulous, fabulous place. If you're looking for the ultimate retreat to stay in Gran Canaria, then Puerto de Magan is it. The hotels here are outrageously priced right around the year. There's a lot of hotels in January that stay shut in Gran Canaria, purely because sort of second, third week in January, it's quiet and it's just not worth it for the larger hotels to open. Every hotel here in Magan is open. The reason is simple is because people just love coming here. And I can see why, and I'll show you around. Like I said, I priced it up to stay here myself. It was £200 a night, which ordinarily I would be happy to pay, but it is just me traveling this week. So when there's two of us, that's fine. But for me, I didn't need to stay here, but nevertheless, I wanted to show you it anyway. It is fabulous. It is my favorite place to stay on the island. So I'm actually at the marina side of Puerto de Magan now and as you can see some very expensive ships, boats, yachts, but the people on them 
and I'm not putting anybody down here, but the people on them look surprisingly ordinary. I don't mean that in a in a bad way. It's just whenever you watch Bond films and it's also like the the spy type things with these ships that are owned by Russian billionaires. That one's for sale. I wonder how much that is. Hmm. But when you see these ships, you always see people on them that were really well dressed. For those of you who remember the BBC series Howard's Way, based down in Channel Island somewhere, they were always well to do, well heeled people, multi millionaires. And these people probably are, but they look surprisingly ordinary. Having never owned a yacht, of course, though, it's all new to me. So, anyway, back to the video then. And what you're looking at here is the Hotel Porto de Magan. This is the one that was priced at, for certainly this visit in January, £200 a night. So, we are at Mirador El Balcon, which is about 1200 feet above sea level, and looking out to well, in the far distance, we've got El Teide, Tenerife. Let me show you. So over there, in the far distance, just through the mist, you can probably see the peak of Teide, which we've been to in a previous video. Tenerife, of course, an island that I love so much. But the star of the show here at the Balcon, Mirador El Balcon, is, is this. Which... Uh, if you haven't got a head for heights, then look away now. Shall I go touch it? What do you think? Shall I go near the edge? I don't, I don't really have a head for heights at all. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. There's the steep drop down. So I thought I'd just show you this. We're about to set off on the hillside pass on the way to Porto de Morgan for lunch. So we've got 62% battery level, but this is going to kill the battery because we climbed to about 2,000 feet above sea level. Now, if I can make it on this battery up to the top of the mountain, and I've got no choice, I have to, then it should be fine because what you'll see is, and I'll show you in a bit, the battery life will recharge. So on the descent from the top of the mountain, with the vehicle doing recharging of the batteries, as it doesn't need any power, it actually recirculates the power, regenerative power as it's called, puts it back into the batteries. And so we've got 62% power. I'll stop when we get to the top of the mountain at 2000 feet. Let's see how much battery that's consumed. It's about a two mile drive. And then I'll show you once we get over the top and onto the bottom on the other side of the mountain, how much regenerative power it's put back into the car. And it'll give you an idea of the range anxiety that you suffer driving a electric car in mountainous roads like you get in the Canaries. So here we are at the top of the mountain, about 2,200 feet above sea level. And as you can see, the battery level has dropped to 55%. So in that short two mile drive, the battery has dropped by 7%. And that was simply because we were going uphill and so we were constantly using energy, an abnormally large amount of energy. Now, that could be worse of course, but it's still 7% in two miles. And to recharge that 7% is going to take about anything between 20 and 30 minutes on a decent speed charger. So I'm not sure if these cars really fit for purpose for the Canary Islands. But I'm going to think about it some more. But what we'll do next is I'll stop at the bottom of the mountain because it literally is downhill from here. And once we get to the bottom, let's see how much power we've managed to put back into the batteries. So stay with me and I'll show you. So, we've made it to the bottom of the mountain now, and uh, we're about 600 feet above sea level. And importantly, we're still at 56% battery, let me show you. 
so there we have it 56 percent battery so we're no better off than we were at the top of the mountain but crucially we're no worse off and actually driving from the top of the mountain to where we are now is about a seven mile drive so in that seven miles the car has used no energy whatsoever and that's because it's been regenerating the force of the car going down the hill so not too bad we've made it thankfully and just going to head back to Porto de Magan for lunch now. So the challenge itself wasn't necessarily driving the Fiat 500. In fact, far from it. I had a whale of a time. I loved driving that Fiat 500. The challenge really, as we saw, was in the charging infrastructure in the Canary Islands, which was not very cheap, not very reliable and not very quick. So I've got my costs now, which I'm just going to go through with you. So in total, we spent £33.08 recharging the car. That was over four days and 286 miles. So that's going to give us roughly about a cost of about £10 for every 100 miles you drive, which certainly used to be the benchmark I used for driving my petrol car here in the UK about 10 or 15 years ago. So from that perspective, bearing in mind it was mountainous roads, so using quite a lot of energy as we saw going up the mountains and not really recuperating as much going down, I didn't think that was too bad. And on the government charges, actually, it wasn't that expensive because whilst I thought it was charging me £12 per charge, it basically reserves £12 of your credit and then you get that back on your credit card a few days later. So actually, the government charges that we saw in those small villages, certainly not one of them cost me more than one or two pounds. So really, my view, would I have an electric car in the Canary Islands? I'm torn. I'm torn, ladies and gentlemen. And let me know what you think in the comments below. But if I was a local, a resident, somebody who worked on the island, who didn't commute very far, who just needed a cheap run around, then the electric car would probably be it. Because I enjoy driving it. I like the talk of electric cars, and we certainly saw that on the Fiat 500 electric this week. However, talking about cheap runarounds, do bear in mind this Fiat 500 costs in the UK a minimum £26,000. And that's for what realistically is a two-door battery-powered car. So I'm not sure whether I'd go down the Fiat 500 route. As much as I like the car, there are probably better value electric cars that you can buy. Would I, would I drive an electric car again in the Canary Islands as a tourist? Probably not. Probably not. So whereas in Britain we've got chargers that go up to 200 kilowatts, probably more, in the Canary Islands, the maximum, the fastest speed I could find was 50 kilowatt, which, as we saw in the video, wouldn't work with this Fiat. So the maximum practical speed I found was at the Holiday World place, where I parked the car overnight a few nights and charged it there. Even then, it was only a 30 kilowatt charge. What does that translate to in hours? From about 10 or 15% battery up to 100%, at least three and a half hours. So you have to find somewhere as a tourist where you can leave the car safely, parked overnight, charging. And those places are few and far between. They're not everywhere, not the 30 kilowatt chargers. For one charge, which I tried, which was basically somebody's house, it was showing a seven and a half hour recharge time. So you could make it as a tourist, but the reality is you'd have to really plan out your trips, really plan out your days. And you could do that if you were really into electric cars, if you were a real EV evangelist, you could do that but you'd have to really want to do it. For everybody else, if you're a tourist, especially for me who just goes and takes these short three to four day trips at a time, in the Canary Islands, I don't spend whole days away from videoing particularly. My time there is very short and very precious. At no real point during the day do I have three and a half hours to sit whilst a car recharges. In the petrol or diesel equivalent, I'd pull into a petrol station, it takes 10 minutes, I might get a coffee and I'd drive on. But that's 10 minutes versus three and a half hours. And that's the difference as a tourist. And I would stress that's the difference as a tourist. I think if you are, as I say, a local, a businessman, you know, somebody who does short commutes, because don't forget Gran Canaria, with the best people in the world, is not a huge island, then yes, yes, I think you could make an electric car work for you. So for my next trip, I'll be in the 8th Canary Island, La Graciosa. You can't drive on the island, you can't hire a car there, it's too small and there aren't really any roads as such. So I won't have to make that decision about petrol, diesel or indeed electric. 
but I will be showing you around the island if we can get the drone up, you'll see it from the sky. It is a fascinating island to visit, I'll be there for two days, so we'll get to meet some of the locals, we'll get to see some of the local cuisine, and we'll find out what life's all about on this small island that, in fact, was only just regarded and recognised as an island of its own right. La Graciosa itself used to be a dependency of Lanzarote. It now has island status, which it didn't have until very recently. So join me in a future video when we'll be looking at La Graciosa. I'm really excited to show you around. Okay.